Thank you for listening to Freedom Church Online. Please stay tuned for a powerful word from God. We would love to have you worship with us in person Sundays at 1045 a.m. at 701 Harwood Road in Bedford. Until then, sit back and enjoy this word. Luke 9. Luke 9. And uh, when you get it, drop down to verse 23. Familiar passage of scripture for those of you Sunday school valedictorians, hermeneutic scholars, people who have matriculated through church all your life. You, you were born in a bow tie, <laughs> raised in a bonnet. You, you know who I'm talking about. So you know the verse. We're talking about the keys to an abundant life. Um, it should be on the screen, but here's what it says. Jesus speaking. Then he said to them, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. Repeat it, read it again. Uh, Then he said to them all, if anyone desires to come after me, let, I'm I'm a gender neutralize it, let them deny themselves, as the ladies like, "Mm mm-hmm, brothers, and take up their cross and follow me. One more time, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Then he said to them, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For the next few moments, I wanna talk about the, from the topic, live relentlessly. Live relentlessly. We've been in a series on the abundant life, and we've been talking about the fact that there is only one key to an abundant life, that Jesus in his address in John chapter number 10 says to us that the thief does not come except to steal, to kill, and to destroy. He says, but I have come, I have come, everybody say come, I have come that they may have life and have it more abundantly. One translation says that they may have it more to the full. One translation says that they may have a quality of life. We've been talking about what the key to an abundant life is. And from the very onset of the series, we've started by saying that there is only one key to an abundant life. That key is Jesus. However, there are times when our keys do not work and we wonder why. It is because just like any other key, if it has not been replicated directly from the master, it will not work properly. And so what we want to do is we want to replicate and duplicate the master so that we can open the door to an abundant life. We've talked about rest as a key to the abundant life. We said the fact that if we're going and going and going, there is no abundance if we do not rest. Go back and listen to the message. We talked about the fact that uh, last week we need to reduce, that less is more, that we, we are not to try to do everything, but that we need to create margin in our lives. And that is a part of an abundant life. If you don't leave room for anything, how are you gonna grow into anything? And so we talked about margin last week. This week, I wanna talk about living relentlessly. I want you to live Live relentlessly. Here's the key. I need you to understand that this is the key. The key is Jesus, but we need to have these ridges on the key so that they work properly in opening the door. And so in living relentlessly, we see Jesus talking to a crowd of people in Luke 9 and 23. Now, let me just say this before we move forward because this is important. I was going to preach, I was going to preach the word release. We, we had rest, reduce, there was relentless was going to be on here. I was going to preach the word release. And I wanted to talk about forgiveness today. I was going to talk about forgiveness, but the Holy Spirit told me, and I'm just telling you this so that you be ready, so that you understand, one, that this is a part of the abundant life. That that releasing and forgiving is a part of the abundant life. That many of us don't live in abundance because we're living in bitterness. Now, the reason why I'm not doing that is because all the yeses, have mercies, the whoops, the oh my God, the shaking of the heads, the feelings, the pity of stomach. All that was what I felt when I started studying. And the Lord said, this is a series, not a message. It's a message for you, but they will come in, in several, several messages because there's so much bitterness that we harbor and don't even know that when we come back, we're going to do a series just on forgiveness. But I need to tell you this because if you go and try to stick the key in and I didn't give you that and it doesn't open and you're still bitter, you'd be like, Pastor, it didn't work. I'm telling you now, if you need to between now and then, figure out 
who you need to forgive or that you need to be forgiven. That's the reason why I couldn't go into all this. It's deep. Because some of y'all are too arrogant and you don't even want to admit the fact that you need to be forgiven. I'm not just talking about by God. You're like, yeah, I need to go to the altar. No, I'm talking about by other people. But in the meantime, you need to go and figure out that piece. If you need to do that, we'll come back and teach on it. But I'm telling you, that's a ridge on your key. And so if you start turning and it doesn't work, you might be bitter. You, you might be unforgiving. You might be in a place where you need to work on some relationships and reconciliation because reconciliation, however, is God's primary business. But today, I want to talk to you about relentless living. I want to talk to you about living relentlessly. And as I thought about that, Joseph is in the house, and he's been working me out. Y'all saw him on the announcements, and he smiles, and he looks all nice, and he's like, thank you, Freedom, for coming, and blah, blah, blah. But he started working me out. And Joseph, Joseph is crazy. Uh, and I'm realizing this, that all these trainer guys are wild. They're just crazy. And, and one of the things, though, that I appreciate about Joseph is that while we're working out, we were working out, we were working out outside, and it was like 19 degrees, and we were outside, and it was 19 degrees. We were outside, and it was 19 degrees, and we were working out, and, and my hands are getting ready to fall off, and he tells me to get on the ground and do an exercise. And, and, and while I'm getting ready to quit because my hands are frostbit, he looks at me and he says, don't give up. He, he looks at me and says, don't give up. Now, one of the things that, that, that we do is every week I have to give him a motivation for what it is that I'm doing. Because I told him, I don't, I don't want to just do this physically. I want to do this spiritually. And so what happens is I have to give him my motivation. So then when it looks like I'm giving up, he says, what's your motivation? And what that does when he points to my motivation, it presents to me a fact that I can't give up. I have to do this relentlessly because this is not about me. It's about the king. That this is not about me, it's about the king. And so I have to learn to live relentlessly. And here's the problem with many of us in our lives. We don't have someone in our corner. We don't have someone in our life. We don't have someone in our ear when life gets cold and life will get cold. Or when life turns up the heat and life will turn up the heat. To tell you to keep going when you want to quit. That there is no one who's telling you the truth. Oftentimes what we look for is someone to coddle us and not to push us. Oftentimes what we look for is someone to keep us comfortable and not push us into the destiny that God has for our lives. Oftentimes what we look for is a soft word and not a motivational word. And what I'm here to give you today, I'm giving you the preface right now because I need you to understand that what I'm about to teach you is not for the faint of heart. This is not for the people who want to be, who want to be uh, held gently. This is going to be some tough love. And the reality is, until you get some tough love, you won't accomplish what God has for you. The abundant life is not for those who aren't willing to work hard. The abundant life is not for those who aren't willing to give up some stuff. The abundant life is not for those who want to lazily sit by and let God drop off a package. You get to open it, and all you do is just sit around and do nothing. That's not it. You walk into this life doing nothing, but you enter this life to do something. I'm going to say that again. You walk into this life doing nothing. You do nothing to earn your salvation. You do nothing to earn God's favor. You do nothing to be accepted by God. But once you get this life, once you get this title, once you get this citizenship, once you get this anointing, once you receive your gift, you've got to do something with it. And Jesus writing to a crowd of people that he's talking to, people who have been following him, people who have been wa watching him and seeing uh, how, he has, how, he has, uh, how he has made miracles and how he has, has, has fed 5,000 people earlier in this chapter. He says to these people who are excited about what he can do for them, he says, it does not stop here. Yes, I want to bless you. Yes, I'll give you abundance. 5,000 people are fed, 12 baskets are kept over. This is just in prior to this. Y'all heard the story, some of you, of the feeding of the 5,000. Jesus takes two small fish, five loaves of bread, breaks them, blesses them, multiplies them, passes them out, and people are literally fed, and there are leftovers afterwards. It was a miracle, a God-like, a, a miracle of God proportions to show you what God can and wants to do in your life. But immediately after the miracles, Andrew, he gives them this. 
Because people will oftentimes think that what God did for me in the beginning is what I need to expect from him all t- at all times. But God says there is an expectation of you as well. And Jesus says to them, if anyone desires to come after me, remember this, John 10, I have come, I have come that they may have life. I have come that they may have abundant life. I have come. And so if he's coming and he shows up, he's going to keep moving because he does not stay stagnant. If Jesus is going after he's come and he's going, what are you doing? You ought to be coming with him. If anyone desires to come after me, if anyone desires to come after me, he says, I have come that they may have life and have it more abundantly. You're going to follow me. You're going to be my disciple. You're going to come after me. He says, and if you want to do that, there's three things you need to do. Three things you need to do. This is the relentless life in a nutshell. I'm going to give you these three things and try to get you out of here as quick as possible. These three things are explicit in the text. I don't even have to point them out. You see them when we read it. He says, then he said to them all, if anyone desires to come after me, first thing, let him deny himself. Point number one, deny. Deny. Deny, 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 deny. In, in, in the player days, back in the day, I'm just me and you, Chris, we're having a conversation. I'm not talking to anybody else. I don't want to just be held against me. In the player days, back in the day, uh, if she saw something in your phone or if she saw someone with you or you found yourself in a position where you were compromised, uh, the rule was <laughs> deny, deny, deny. I mean, you, you got to convince her that she either gonna trust you or her lying eyes. <laughs> but the thing was, you deny, deny, deny. Now, 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 it was the wrong attitude with the right strategy. It, it was the wrong motive, but it was the right strategy. Can I come back to everybody else? The, the reality is, uh, the enemy twists our ingenuity, and he messes us up. The right strategy is to deny. But Jesus says, watch this, you're denying what you've done. I need you to deny yourself. He says, I need you to deny yourself. Now, I need you to get this now. Don't, don't, don't try to read the text as a 2018 person because in our 2018 context, we take personality profiles and we learn about our strengths and we take gift assessments and we find out more about ourselves. And so what you hear automatically when I say deny yourself, you in 2018 here deny your gifts, deny your strengths, deny your personality, deny Deny your skills. Deny your talents. Back up. Let's go to a first century context. Jesus is talking to people, watch this, who have have not seen a prophet for over 400 years. Listen, between the Old Testament and the New Testament, if I can teach you something, there is the period of what they call the silent period, where for 400 years there has not been a prophet in Israel. And Jesus is coming to the house of Israel to teach them, to show them, to prove to him that he is the Messiah, that every prophet who ever prophesied was prophesying about him, that he was the Savior. He was the one who they had always been waiting for. And here's what happened. For 400 years, no prophet. What happens when you have no word from heaven? What happens when you have no word from above? You begin to live the way you want to live. You begin to do things the way you want to do them. You begin to do stuff, watch this, in your personality, but out of control. You you use what it is that God gave you, but it's perverted for your own selfish gain. You use what it is that God placed in you, but it's now out of control. You, 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 you got to understand that these people that Jesus is talking to in the text, he says, if anybody is going to come after me, watch this, these people in that day, that, that many of them would look for a rabbi or a philosopher or in this Greek culture, they would look for some type of a wise sage to follow and find out what is it that I'm supposed to do. Notice this, that when Jesus goes to his disciples and he calls them, the first thing he says is, drop everything, follow me. The reason why we're confused about how dudes would do that is because they recognized him as the wise one. They recognized him as a teacher. They recognized him as a rabbi. This means nothing to us because we're skeptical about everybody. 
But when they saw someone who was worth following, they would follow them because they realized I can't make decisions on my own. I'm perverted in myself. They, they understood this. Watch this. Plato, Aristotle, all of these dudes had, watch this word, disciples. All of these Greek philosophers had disciples. What, is, what does that mean? They had people who followed them and their teaching. And so Jesus is saying, you're looking for someone to follow. You're looking for someone to come after. You're looking for someone to help you understand how your way is wrong. But what is the right way? In, in, this, Greek, in this Greek time, they, they would reason and logic about what it is that was uh, going on. And they would try to weigh what was truth and what was a lie. They were looking for someone to give them truth. Jesus says, I'm the wise sage. He says, but if you come after me, you can't bring Plato with you. If you come after me, you can't bring Aristotle with you. If you come after me, watch this, you're going to have to get a different understanding of Moses. If you come after me, you can't take what it is that you've developed on your own. you got to come after me denying yourself and everything else that you've learned so that I can reprogram it and place you in a new context. Now here's what God is basically saying. He said, I am looking to redeem you with my outstretched hand. I am looking to strengthen you. I'm looking to buy back what the enemy has stolen. I'm willing to pay for it and turn it into everything that I ever designed for it to be. This is why some of you have been so out of place in your life. Your personality just don't fit. And you're wondering, what's happened? Why don't people accept me? What's going on? You need to give it to the Lord and let him use it for his purpose. You need to give it to the Lord and let him use it for his context. Here's what I think about when I see this. Our identity needs to be reassigned. Watch this. He says you need to deny yourself. Here's what Jesus is doing. He's not doing this, watch this, to put you down. He's doing this to protect you. When he reassigns your identity, here's what he's doing. He's putting you in the witness protection program. Yeah. <laughs> that, that, that our job, according to Acts 1.8, is to be witnesses of the gospel in Judea, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the world. Our job is to take the stand and talk about Jesus to an opposing enemy world. But here's the problem. Once you take the stand, you've now been marked by the devil. And what the Lord says is, if you're going to come after me, which means if you're going to testify of what I've taught you, if you're going to be a disciple of what I'm giving you, if you're going to do any of these things, here's what you're going to have to do. You're going to have to deny your old identity, take on a new identity, let me reassign and relocate you to a new place for a new life. And the problem with many of us is we're so hung up on who we are that we won't allow God to make us who he wants us to be. Say it again. We're so hung up on who we are that we won't allow God to make us who he wants us to be. What do you mean, Pastor? I'll explain it to you. That many of us have quirks in our personality. That yes, God has made you detail-oriented, but he did not make you paranoid and afraid of releasing control. That many of us are visionary, but God did not make us visionary and big time, uh, big, big thinkers or, or, or broad thinkers for us to be irresponsible and ignore detail. That we're so hung up in who we say we are. Well, I'm just not a people person. That doesn't give you the right to be rude. You should have said amen for every rude person that you ever came in contact with that just said, well, I'm just not a people person. Stop using who you are as an excuse to not become who he's called you to be. The first thing he tells you to do, everybody shout and say, deny. deny. When the enemy comes looking for you, you should be permanently saying, and he brings up who you used to be. You ought to be able to say with confidence, that's not me. When the enemy comes looking for you and he brings up what you used to do, you ought to be able to say, that's not me. He ought to be able to say, but you're the same height, but that's not me. You're the same way, but that's not me. You got the same voice, but that's not me. Listen, I even know your personality, but that's not me. My heart has been changed. I've been relocated and reassigned. I've been given a new identity and a new address. I am a citizen of heaven. I deny all of that old stuff. I am now in the witness protection program. Devil, when you come looking for me, you won't find me because I don't exist anymore. There's too many of us, watch this, who are holding on to our old selves and it's an ankle bracelet for the enemy. Help somebody before I move on. 
so many of us are wearing an ankle bracelet of our own selves. Watch this. That we come to church and cover it up in what we wear. Now, I know in Freedom Church, you don't cover it up too much. We wear T-shirts and jeans and all this stuff. But, but underneath your jeans and J's, <laughs> underneath your suit and stockings from our old school folks. Some of us are wearing an ankle bracelet that when we come in here, we lift our hands and we shout and we look good on Sunday, but the enemy looks at his GPS and he says, yeah, she at church. We're going to catch her at 7-Eleven afterwards. And because you have not denied yourself and not accepted or assumed your new identity, the ankle bracelet keeps allowing the enemy to find you and you wonder why you're still stuck in the same place. Because who you were supposed to escape from, you keep giving him a tracker to come and find you. It's that old attitude. Yeah. It's that old self. It's that old habit. It's that old issue. Until you cut it off. God Almighty, I'm trying to help somebody. Until you cut it off. I'm not talking about leaving it on your dresser. You need to do like they do in the commercials when they find the GPS tracker. Throw it over the bridge, into the river, let it float away forever, and let them be confused about where you are. Enemy, you can't find me unless God gives you an opportunity to come and get me because I'm not the same. Shout deny. That's a strong word. It's a strong word. In the scripture, the only other place where I see the word deny used as strongly is when Peter denies Jesus. Look, 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 look at Luke, Luke chapter 22. Luke chapter 22, verses 54 through 62. says, having arrested him, Jesus is the him, they've arrested him, he's getting ready to die. Let me tell you something real quick about reading the Bible too fast. They arrested him, which means he's going to die, which means he's going to get up which means you have victory. Whenever you see something like that in the Bible, it ought to make something jump in you. All right. Having arrested him, they led him and brought him into the high priest's house. But Peter following at a distance. Let me say it this way. Peter walked behind them at a distance. Now when they had kindled a fire in the midst of the courtyard, they're all standing around the fire first, and then they sit down together. Peter, watch this, sat among them. And certain, a certain servant girl, seeing him, as he sat by the fire, looked intently at him and said, this man was also with him. His ankle bracelet was on. But he denied it, saying, now he doesn't deny himself and say, yeah, I was with Jesus. Because when I was with y'all, I was a different person. And I'm not that person anymore. I'm with Jesus now. Peter denies Jesus. Jesus says, deny yourself. We are too busy denying Jesus. Yeah. I'm going to come back to that. Nope, let me stay there right now. You're looking at Peter and saying, I've never denied Jesus. Have you, though? Yeah. <laughs> when the conversation comes up at work and there's a biblical answer for it, do you engage in the gossip or do you bring up the scripture? Because he is the word. Y'all missed it. Because he is the word, if there is a word for that situation and you deny the word an opportunity to provide a solution, you deny Jesus. In your own life, when you're called to make a decision between what it is that you should do and you ought not do, and you find yourself desiring and even making an excuse or a judgment about why you're going to do what you want to do, don't you know that in that moment you denied him the opportunity to bless you? You, you deny him because when you obey him, watch this, obedience leads to blessing. And when you don't obey him, you deny him the opportunity to bless you. Keep reading. Woman, I don't know him. And after a little while, another saw him. You're also of them. Because here's the thing. While, while, while we're in church and we have our ankle bracelet on and the enemy knows where we are, the reality is, I'm not going to beat you up, I need you to understand this. You're still wearing your anointing too. So it's his anointing that is identifying him in this place, but he keeps trying to show off his ankle bracelet. That some of us, watch this, while people keep saying stuff like, well, you're just different. And they, they can't put their finger on why we're different, but we want to show them our ankle bracelet. But I'm down though. I'm still cool. I watch the same shows you watch. I still cuss like you cuss. I do all the stuff you do. You're so busy trying to be cool that you can't be comforted by the Holy Spirit. 
See, I'm good. I don't have no desire to be cool. I don't have no desire to be liked. I don't have no desire to be accepted by people because I already got all of that with him. And funny thing I found out, Brandon, is that when I stop looking for it from them and I get it from him, I get it from them. Because they can't understand why I got peace and they don't. They can't understand why I got joy while they sad. They can't understand why I'm not confused while they're confused. They can't understand why I'm okay while everything is in disarray. They, they can't understand it. And what it does is it draws them to me like a magnet. And what I do is I point them. Oh, somebody got it. Okay, and after a while, another saw him and said, you are also of them. But Peter said, man, I am not. Check out my ankle bracelet. 59. Then, after about an hour had passed, another confidently affirmed, saying, surely this fellow also was with him, for he is a Galilean. And one translation says, and his speech denies him. But Peter said, man, I don't know what you're saying. Now, we've been taught that Peter starts cussing. He starts going on. I don't know this. Some of y'all so fresh in your salvation that the whole word met you outside of your head before. But like, man, if I got to tell you one more time, we thought that's what he did. Peter, watch this, one translation says, he began to, to curse. What he's not doing is cussing them out or cussing about Jesus. Peter, watch this, in his denial of Jesus and acceptance of himself, evokes a curse upon himself. Here's what it's equivalent to. Watch this. Y'all anachronize and 21st centurize the text all the time. He cussed them out. This is not a reality show, okay? Peter is evoking a curse on himself. He says, watch this, may God damn my soul if I know Jesus. May God bring eternal judgment upon my soul if I know this man. It feels like ain't no coming back from that. It just feels like that. That's, 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 that's it. He denies Jesus, and in the process of denying, I pray, y'all get, what's my first point? Deny. deny yourself. Now, here's the problem. Deny is a neutral word. And I'm going to give you the point. You're going to walk away with it. But if you deny Jesus, in the process of denying Jesus, Peter evokes a curse upon his own life. And the Lord turned. Oh, let me say, let me go back. Immediately while he was still speaking, the rooster crowed. Now, prior to this, Jesus told him, he, Peter says, I'll never deny you, bro. You my, 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 my day one, and I'm going to have your back even if all these other cowards run away. He said that in front of the other disciples. He said, even if all these other cowards run away, I'm down. And everybody else ran, and he was right. I'm going to follow at a distance. He walked, he stood, he sat, and he denied. I'm going to show you why that's dangerous in a minute. And the Lord turned and looked at Peter. And Peter, remember the, Lord, the word of the Lord, how he said, before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. So Peter went out and wept bitterly. Let me give you uh, some good news, though, that when Jesus gets up, he says, go find the brethren and Peter. That watch this. There is no curse that you could even evoke on yourself that is greater than the cross. That Peter evokes a curse upon himself, but after Jesus gets up out of the grave, he comes looking for Peter specifically because the curse that Peter spoke over himself has been broken by the power of the cross. And no matter what you've done, no matter what you've said, no matter how you did it, no matter who you did it with, no matter when you did it, it could have been right before service, the cross has the power to cancel the curse. What is that relevant to deny yourself? Well, it's just a generational family thing. We all big. We all lazy. We all can't. We all don't. My whole family, the cross can cancel the curse. Deny yourself. Now, let me show you where Peter went wrong and where many of you are going wrong. Psalm 1. Psalm 1 shows me the pattern that Peter followed that ends up in his destruction. Remember I told you, he walked, he stood, he sat. Blessed the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly. The people were getting ready to murder his best friend. He's hanging out with them. Question, this is my Jay-Z fans, who you with? 
Who are you hanging out with? Who are you around? Who are you spending time with? What relationships are you connected to? Shout out to her, Tasha, who next month is going to do a relationship connections workshop. Okay? You need to see her because you need to connect with the right people. If you're walking in the counsel of the ungodly, the counsel is the advice of. So while I'm walking with them and I'm listening to what they're saying about Jesus, it curbs me from saying what I need to say about Jesus. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Got to keep going. Nor stands in the path of sinners. Notice that I got from walking with them to where I'm a little more comfortable. We just chilling now. We just standing together. I I'm comfortable. I didn't keep moving when they stopped. I stopped, but they stopped. And when they move, I move. Just like that. It says, nor stands in the path of sinners. Watch the next thing. The Bible says that he walked with them. He stood by the fire. Then the Bible says he sat by the fire. Nor sits in the seat of the scornful. That, that Peter got progressively comfortable denying who he was in Christ and picking up his old self. Peter got progressively comfortable walking outside of the will of God and into his own will. And when Jesus says, if you're going to come after me, I need you to forget the, the, the progress you've been making in the wrong direction and pick up, no, we, we're not going to pick up your cross yet, but he says, I need you to deny the progress you've been making in the other direction. He says, you've been standing and sitting and walking, but I need you to stand up and walk in the other direction. Come after me. And here's what the Bible says, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. This is where you get your new identity. This is where you figure out who you really are. Stop letting people tell you who you're not and let God tell you who you are. His delight is in the law of the Lord. No, notice this, that David does not call the law of the Lord a burden. David does not call the law of the Lord some heavy thing that I have to carry and it's just a big responsibility and a weight. He says it's a delight. That if you really understand the word that you're reading, you'll understand it is freedom. All right? His delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law, he meditates day and night. Spend some time in the word of God so that you can understand who it is that you are. Somebody shout again, deny. Deny, deny. deny. The one thing I need you to do, I need you to figure out, is you need to get out of your own way. Get out of your own way. Some of us are so comfortable with ourselves, so comfortable with who we are. And here's what we call it. We call it acceptance. No, it's complacency. You, 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 just don't have the, you just don't have a desire to crow anymore. You just don't desire, have a desire to be conformed anymore to the image of his son. The reality is you were created in the image of God, but that image is marred by your sin and your decisions. Here's what the Lord says. I want to conform you back into my image, but it's going to take some work. And for many of us, we like, well, I'm cool with who I am. I'm tired of the preacher trying to tell me what I'm supposed to be. And that's fine. You can live a complacent life, and you can live a, 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 a low life. But if you want to live an abundant life, somebody shout, deny. Yeah. Next thing is, you need to die. Yeah. <laughs> I know, that's like rough. Everybody's like, well, I'm not ready to die. Me either. Not in the way that you're thinking. Jesus says, then he said to them all, if anyone should come at desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily. Take up his cross daily. This, again, when we look at it, we look at it from hindsight, seeing that Jesus is saying, take up your cross, and we've heard messages preached on what a cross is and what it means to bear a cross, and we sing songs like, must Jesus bear the cross alone and all the world go free? The reality is, when these people heard, take up your cross, they thought about execution. It's like me telling you, if you're going to come after Christ, go buy you an electric chair. If you're going to come after Christ, go sit in the gas chamber. If you're going to come, out, come after Christ, go drink the poison coolant. I mean, they heard some crazy, radical stuff. What these people are actually hearing is Jesus saying, anybody who wants to come after me needs to be ready to die. As a matter of fact, in church history, they say that before they would baptize somebody, they would ask them one question. And I heard that they still do this in countries where there's persecution over Christianity. They ask you one question. Before you get baptized, it's not do you believe that Jesus Christ died for your sins, he was buried and he rose again on the third day? So we ask you, because we say the belief is found just in what you say. They say, I know you're going to say it, but are you going to live it? 
And here's what they ask, the question that they ask in places that are war-torn, places that are torn apart by persecution of Christians. Here's where they look you in the face and they ask you, hey, are you willing to die for your belief in Jesus Christ? And they're not talking about some spiritual, metaphorical death. They're not talking about some, some ethereal, uh, 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 theological principle of dying to yourself. These people are asking you, are you willing that if they find out that you are baptized to die? Because here's the thing. If you're not willing to die, I'm still going to have to die because they're going to kill me for baptizing you. So are you willing to die because I'm not willing to risk my life on your fake salvation? Right? And that's the way they had to live. This is what the first century people heard. Jesus is saying, there's going to come a time where it's going to break loose. And if you say that you believe me, if you say that you're coming after me, it's going to get crazy. Now, thank God we live in a country where we can say Jesus' name out in public and nobody denies us, nobody persecutes us, nobody tries to kill us. But I think what that has done has created a watered-down version of what it is that we say we believe. The question I'm asking anybody here today is, are you willing to die for what you say you believe? It's real, right? You shouldn't preach this if you want to fill the house. If you want to fill the house, you tell them, there's a time coming and we're going to have a good time. And that's true. And I'm going to get to that in just a second. But before I move forward, and not cast my pearls before a swine. I need to find out, is there anybody in Freedom Church who believes Jesus enough that if the government shutdown turns into government persecution, that you're willing to say, God, for you I live and for you I'll die. I'll stand in front of the firing squad. They can chop my head off. See, some people ain't trying to hear that. This ain't real. But you do understand, there are people who say they believe in Jesus in Sudan, this is how they live. There are people who live in China, they got to have church underground. I got a microphone because I want people in the street to hear what it is that I'm saying. I'm loud enough to preach without it, but I want everybody outside to hear about Jesus. They can't do it. They'll get killed for having this kind of meeting. This is treason. But do you believe it enough? Or is it convenient Christianity? You know, there's an old song that says, any way you bless me, God, I'll be satisfied. I think we've changed the lyrics to that song is, as long as you bless me, God. Yeah. First Corinthians chapter 15, verse 31. Paul, Paul, Paul is talking about death in Christ. He says, I affirm by the boasting in you, which I have in Christ Jesus, our Lord, I die daily. Woo, watch this. And Paul says, there are people who have heard that I'm preaching the gospel to y'all, that I'm preaching the gospel in certain places, and they have marked my head for death. And every day I wake up, I die. Watch what he says. My life don't mean anything to me anymore. I'm going to do what I'm purposed to do, and if I get killed for doing it, so be it. Now, let me challenge somebody. Because you thought your purpose was to make a whole bunch of money. And so if you died, you'll be like, but I didn't fulfill my purpose. See, that's not your purpose. Your purpose is to glorify God and lead other people to do the same thing. And if you glorify God, however that happens, that's your purpose. Now, each one of us has a different manifestation of purpose, a different destiny that we got to live out. But the reality is, you need to start living in purpose so that you can say like Paul, when I wake up, if I'm going to do God's will and glorify other people, if I die, I die. Here's what I love about this, though. That Paul has determined, like Jesus told us, he said, take up your cross daily. Take up your cross daily. Paul is repeating what Jesus said. He's just saying it in a more emphatic way. Jesus says, take up your cross. These people would have heard, take up your cross as death. Paul says, I die daily. Like every day I wake up, I die. I do not do my own thing. I deny myself and I die. I deny myself and I die. I deny myself and I die. Watch this. That as he says this, he is understanding, though, that the power of salvation is only fully realized in the purpose of sacrifice. Say that slow, y'all didn't get that. That the power of salvation is only fully realized in the purpose of sacrifice. How do we get our salvation? It is through the death, burial, the resurrection of Jesus. That there is no, there is no salvation without the sacrifice. 
Watch this. That if there is no death, there is no resurrection. So what Paul is trying to teach us and what Jesus is trying to teach us is that as a believer, death is not your final destination. You should not be afraid of death. You should not be worried about death. You should not be tripping on death. What you should do is say to yourself, I'm willing to die so I can come back up again. And here's the thing. If I die physically, I'll wake up in heaven. But if I die, watch this, to my emotions, if I die to my desires, if I die to the things of this world, God will raise me back up with greater purpose on the inside. Here's what God is trying to tell somebody. If you don't die, you can't experience the power. If you don't die, you can't get what I have for you. In fact, it's the darkness of death that helps us appreciate the destiny of resurrection. I watched a video this week and the kids in Puerto Rico have been 112 days without power in their school. They were sitting in the class and they were sitting in the dark. My mind says, why are they going to school in the dark? Teacher was still teaching in the dark. They were still listening in the dark. I'm going somewhere. They were still sitting there in the dark. The video that I showed was when the power came back. The moment the power came back, I'm watching this video, the kids begin to scream and shout. Teachers are dancing in the halls. Everybody's going crazy. They're rejoicing. I said, they're at school. They've been sitting in the dark. They finally got light. Look at the board. Look at the teacher. Learn something. Write something down. No, because they have been in the darkness. Now they can appreciate the light. And I'm telling somebody who is willing to die for what it is that God is doing, that when you go through the darkness of death, you can celebrate the light of resurrection. Die daily so that you can appreciate the life that he gives you daily. Die daily so that every breath means something and you don't take it for granted. Die daily so that every blessing that comes your way will not be something that you critique and complain about, but that you celebrate in the presence of the angels and the presence of people. You ought to die. The result of death in the Christian life is resurrection. That's why Jesus, after this very verse in Luke 9, 24 through 26, says that if a man tries to save his own life, he'll lose it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll watch what Jesus says anyway. You're going to die anyway. You might as well die with me so I can give you life again. You might as well die with me so I can give you purpose. You might as well die. Listen, you're dying anyway. Some of us are living dead, walking, walking dead. What's the show? Walking dead. Yeah, yeah. Zombies. And Jesus says, you might as well die with me because I got power. The Bible says the same power. The same power that raised Jesus from the dead will raise you up and give you strength in your mortal body. You ought to die so that you can receive power. Point number three, determine. Deny, die, determine. Jesus says, follow me. I told you before that people in those days were looking for a rabbi. They were looking for a philosopher. They were looking for someone to follow. Jesus calls Andrew and Peter, and he says, follow me. They drop their nets, and they follow. He calls James and John. He says, follow me. They drop their nets, and they follow him. He calls Matthew from the tax collector's booth. He drops everything about his business, and he follows Jesus. They had no clue where he was taking them. They had no clue what they were in for. They had no clue what it was going to bring about. Here's the reason why I'm preaching this message, and I believe the Holy Spirit led me to preach this message today. Because usually we preach messages that try to give you the end and show you what's going to happen and convince you that if this happens, you ought to want to serve Jesus. If this is going to be the outcome, you ought to want to follow him. If this is going to be the the, the result, you ought to want to shout and shout in advance because this is coming. And I do that, and I will do it again someday. I'm not saying that's wrong, but I think every now and again, there ought to be a message that says, I don't know what God's going to do in your life. I don't don't know what he has planned for you. I I know the plans to prosper you, not to harm you, to give you hope and a future, but here's the reality. That don't look like what it looks like for everybody. It don't look the same. I I don't know what God has determined for you, but I'm determined to follow Jesus. 
He says, if you're going to come after me, if you're going to walk into an abundant life, if you're going to walk into a life of quality and quantity, if you're going to walk into a life of purpose, that's all I can guarantee you. I can't guarantee you any material thing. I can't guarantee you any physical thing. I can't guarantee you any defined end, except for the fact that there's purpose on the other side of it. Except for the fact that he's not a liar. Except for the fact that he's going to take you into a place that he's promised you. I can't guarantee you anything. The only thing I can guarantee you is that God has a plan and a purpose. In Genesis chapter number 12, God talks to Abraham. Here's what he says. Now the Lord says to Abram, get out of your country, from your family, from your father's house. Y'all know that when Jesus says that he's God, you know that everything that happens in the Old Testament, he repeats it. When God calls Abram out, he says, get out of your country, from your family, from your father's house. When Jesus called John and James, here's what he says, follow me. Here's what he was telling them. Get out of the boat, representative of your country, leave your father's house, and follow me. Amen. Jesus, Jesus emphatically proves that he is God by doing everything God does. And in the Hebrew culture, those people noticed what Jesus was doing. That's why the Bible says in John 8, they picked up stones to kill him for saying that he was God. And y'all arguing over the internet. These people said that he was that he said he was God. And y'all gonna argue with Facebook prophets, but anyway. <laughs> Verse two, I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. But go back, go back, go back, go back, go back. Go back. I, I skipped over something. He says, Go from your family, from your house, from your father's house, to the land, I'll show you. And he says, Now, now when you get there, you're gonna have purpose. There's gonna be a lot of y'all. Well, Lord, where are we going to be? Is it going to be hot? Is it going to be cold? It's going to be a lot of y'all. <laughs> says, I'm going to make y'all famous. Well, God, are we going to be infamous? Or are we going to be famous? Y'all going to be famous. He says, he says now you're going to bless other people. We're going to bless them with money. We're going to bless them with words. You're going to be a blessing. Now watch verse 3. Here's what he says. He says, I will bless those who bless you. I will curse him who curses you. Remember what I said about curses. Now, ain't, God ain't cussing nobody out. <laughs> Think when you read your Bible, right? And then you're like, Peter was cussing people out. Then does that mean God was cussing people out? And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. But notice the lack of detail. Just to follow me, and I got a good plan for your life. I'm challenging the people today to not desire the hype, to not desire anything else but him. And when you desire him, and when you desire what he has for you, understanding, I'm determined to walk with Jesus. Why? Because he's Jesus. Because everything he said has come to pass. Because everything he does is good. Because he has a plan. Because he has a purpose. Because it's all working together. For not just for my good, but for the good of his entire plan. I'm going to follow Jesus. Whether it's dark, whether it's light, whether it's crooked, whether it's straight, whether it's uphill, whether it's downhill, whether I feel good, whether I feel bad, I'm just going to walk with Jesus. Whether I, 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 I lose my financial aid, whether I get a full scholarship, whether I, I find myself in promotion or I get demoted, I'm going to follow Jesus. Why do I preach this at the beginning of the year that you need to live relentlessly? Because there are several of us who come to church determined to start the year doing what we're going to do. And as soon as God doesn't do it the way that I saw it, I quit. And I want to challenge you this third week of the year to be determined. I'm walking with Jesus. I'm going with him. When I start it, I finish. By the grace of God, I will not fall off. And if I do, I will dust off, get back up and say, God, I'm determined. I will follow you. That means I got to stay close to you. I was leaving the studio one night when I was trying to be a singing group with my cousin. We were the main event. It's time to show you what we came here for, the main event. Man, black think he could write. We was going hard. <laughs> Love is a crazy game. People like to play. I want to play it with you. We was right. That's that 90s fake Jodeci stuff. You know? We were leaving the studio one night. Ravel, you need to watch this on Facebook Live. Ravel's driving his Ford Explorer, and he drives out. We were in Burbank, California. I didn't know how to get home. Ravel is in front of me. He's driving. He speeds off. I'm trying to catch up to speed up to catch Ravel. He speeds off. I'm speeding. He's speeding. I lose him. But I got to keep speeding because I got to catch him. I'm lost. Right? Next thing you know, lights. He gone. He back at home. I think he was a newlywed at the time. 
inference on the speeding. I get left behind. I was following the wrong person and got caught up. Well, I didn't know where I was going. I couldn't stay close enough to him. He left me. Police pulled me over, give me a ticket. And I tell the police officer, I was following somebody. He says, well, they were speeding too. I just didn't catch them. Wow. Basically, what he tells me is, you still broke the law. You're following the wrong person. And that day, I determined in my head, anywhere I go, this is before Google Maps and all that on your phone, have me a Thomas guide. And I, and I, and I, <laughs> I'm going to know exactly where it is that I'm going. Why? Why am I going to know exactly where it is I'm going? Because I'm not going to follow the wrong person anymore. I'm not going to follow the wrong person anymore because when you follow the wrong people, they get you in bad predicaments. And I wasn't going to follow anybody. The problem is for many of us, you decided not to follow anyone anymore. And so when Jesus shows up and says, follow me, you have a vow in your mind. He says, but what if you leave me and I get left behind? You need to determine in your head that I will stay close to you, Lord, close enough to follow, close enough to hear you, close enough to take direction. I thank God for GPS because now all I got to do is turn the music down and listen. Matter of fact, she'll turn it down for me. That, 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 that she'll, she'll, she'll quiet my music and say, in 300 feet, make a left turn on Sylvania Avenue. And I'm like, I was listening to that. But she says, that was a distraction for you. And sometimes God will turn some stuff down in your life so that he can turn himself up so that you can hear him. Because he knows that where he's leading you is where you ought to be. And somebody in this house ought to be determined not to be frustrated, not to be angry, not to be upset over him turning down some stuff. But you're determined to hear his voice. Yeah, yeah. And to follow him. Last thing, and I'm out of here, Warren. You can start playing softly. I was driving in a car garage <laughs> the other day I pull up in this car garage and I have a limited time to get to where I'm going and it's one of those garages I don't know if y'all seen those new ones but it says 236 and on this digital board that means there are 236 available parking spaces in this garage so I know that there are available spaces and I get in and I start driving and I'm driving and as I'm driving there are no spaces and so it's one of those ones that wind up, and I'm going on this level, full, full. Going on this level, full, full. Something in me says, man, they said 236. Maybe you saw it wrong. Maybe it said 2.36. <laughs> and I'm looking at it, and I'm, we had a, uh, there's no parking spaces. And I'm just about to give up. When I look and I'm like, man, this Audi is parked on every level. Y'all missed it. <laughs> I looked and I said, this Hyundai is parked on every level. What I realized was, my embarrassment is your game. I've been circling the same level the entire time. And right before I gave up, my perspective changed. I saw that I wasn't headed in the right direction. And I immediately turned right instead of left and went up the ramp and there was a space for me on the next level. There was always the space because I saw no cars pass me. I saw nobody come near me. The space was always available for me. But in my determination, right before I quit, I changed my perspective. Right before I gave up, I changed my perspective. Right before I gave up, he showed me something that kept me from driving out of that lot into another place, missing my appointment. I was a space for me on the next level. God says there's a space for you on the next level. That the next level of your Christian journey, there's a space for you in the plan that he has. A space for you in the purpose that he's destined and determined for you. There's space for you. He specifically carved it out for you. There's a space available for you. But because you're not living relentlessly, you're not willing to deny, die, and you're not determined to keep going, you quit too soon. And your January resolution to walk closer to God turns into your February embarrassment that I haven't been in three weeks. Here's what the Lord says. You're circling around and you're saying, I did this last year. I did this in 2015. 
I took 2014 off. 2013, I did it. But this year, you notice, that seems to be in the same spot it was when I saw it three years ago. I'm going to turn left instead of right. I'm going to go up the ramp, and there's a space specifically designed for you. But it's only to those who on the ridge of their key are willing to live relentlessly. That means I'm willing to go after what God has for me no matter how I feel, no matter what it looks like, no matter what they say, no matter what I, I did not do right, because it's not about you, it's about him. I want you to imagine right now your space. What space has God promised that he's carved out for you? See, see, this book is like that sign in the front that said 236. He let me know there's plenty of available room. The Bible says your gift will make room for you, place you before great men. What, what is God making room for you for? What promise has he given to you? Now ask yourself, what determination do you need to make this year that you're going to live relentlessly in the presence of God? So that you can feel the promises of God. Thanks for listening to this message. We hope you enjoyed it. You can also view a videotaped message on our app, My Freedom DFW, found in any app store. And remember, love free, live free, be free.